So masterminds. Who's ever been in a mastermind group? Anybody? I tell you what, masterminds are brilliant. Adeline, you've done two, right? Excellent. Okay. Yeah, masterminds are really, really good. Imagine again, if you've got eight to 10 people that are there to support you, okay? people that are working to help you overcome the hurdles in your way. People that are committed to helping you achieve success. Napoleon Hill, uh, if you haven't yet, I'd really recommend reading Napoleon Hill's books. Uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People is a great one. He said, no two minds ever come together without there by creating that third invisible, intangible force, which may be likened to a third mind. Many, many, many successful people get involved with mastermind groups. Like I said, imagine you've got eight to 10 people that are there to help you solve your problem. Okay, masterminds are really, really useful. A good mastermind can literally transform your life and your business. And when I say that, one plus one doesn't equal two. One plus one equals 11. Now, mathematically, I know that doesn't make sense. Joking apart, though, it's exponential. Okay, so instead of one plus one being two, it becomes 11. They can be exclusive and expensive, but totally worthwhile. So when I say exclusive and expensive, again, it's going to depend on the type of mastermind that you join or the type of mastermind group, of course, that you host. So depending on your niche or the members that you attract, uh, you know, they may last forever. They may last only for shorter periods of time, but it's peer to peer interaction rather than traditional student teacher. So you're not standing in front of the group and telling them you are not the mastermind. It's the peers. You are becoming a facilitator and it's the peers that are really the people that are doing all the work. Now, I said they can be exclusive and expensive. Exclusivity actually sells, right? So you might only have a mastermind group that opens up twice a year, maybe once every six months, or maybe once a year, again, depending on how long your masterminds actually run for. And you can build up your audience so that you've actually got a waiting list to join your masterminds. So there's four keys to a successful mastermind. There's structure. So without a strong structure, they're probably going to turn into social gatherings. Okay, it's not a networking event. Whilst there is networking there, it's not a networking event. So there's got to be structure. There's got to be rules in most things. So the structure ensures equal contribution and participation as well as maximum efficiency and effectiveness. So your structure, meaning how, what's going to be the flow? And I'm going to give you an example of a mastermind shortly. You want to have commitment because without commitment from everyone, members are going to lose trust in each other. And that also leads to less results and less potency. Okay. So everybody's going to be committed to the group. You don't just join a mastermind group. And so there are free mastermind groups. Yeah, they can work but there's, you've got to keep a tight rein on it. Right? I think if you're in a mastermind group, everybody's got to be totally committed. You've got to be there for every session. You've got to have input. You've got to know what's the problem that you're going to be working on. You've, you've got to come there with your A game. The people, okay, the people are going to be very important. So synergistic interaction between like-minded people who are committed to growing and evolving both themselves and the other people in the group. Okay? When you've got different perspectives can actually help people to see different sides of the equation. So it's like thinking outside the box. One person thinks this way, another person thinks this way. And suddenly, like I said, it becomes exponential. So it's different perspectives are great. You've heard the saying, look through a fresh pair of eyes. The thing is, though, that if your people are too dissimilar, 
then that can lead to not finding common ground and maybe some discord and even conflict. Okay, so you want to have the right people within your groups. You also have the consistency. Okay, so members that know what to expect and what's expected of them. And your groups run the same every time. Okay, it's like clockwork. You meet at the same time every week or every two weeks or every month or however your group is set up. You've got to have rules and structure. You've got to also know what's included within your program. So your audience, your members must know what's included for them. What are they going to get? Well, obviously, there's going to be networking, right? Masterminds, by default, there's going to be networking. You also want to know, are they going to have any one-to-one -one calls with you? So maybe, as an example, we've got the mastermind, and let's say we're meeting once a month, and I've got 10 people. I might offer each of those 10 people one one-to-one -one coaching uh, with me after each, section, after each uh, session, and that is to help them to implement and become even clearer about what they said they were going to implement from the last meeting. They might have a private online group. So again, a Facebook group specifically for them, or maybe specifically for all the people that have gone through your mastermind groups. Again, it just depends on what you're offering. You could have local events and meetups. It might even happen in a luxury retreat. Maybe you've got a mastermind group that happens in, uh, in the Seychelles, right? Or the Bahamas or whatever it might be. I've actually thought about doing an NLP training, PRAC and Master PRAC, and doing sort of the whole gold package and going to do that in Bali for three weeks. Also, have them understand, are there going to be any guest speakers? So what are they getting for joining your mastermind group? So I might do a mastermind group, and, and this is a hypothetical because it's like asking how long is a piece of string. I might have a mastermind group. Let's say that we're going to meet uh, once every two weeks for six months. And I might charge them 5,000 pounds each. And let's say I've got 10 people in the, in the group. So in six months, I make 50,000 pounds. Mastermind itself, each session might be, let's say, three hours. So I've got three hours, let's say twice per month. So that's six hours, six uh, months. So 36 hours for, for 50,000 pounds. Yeah, not too bad if you can get it. Uh, now, you, like I said, you might have some guest speakers. Do you have to pay the guest speaker? Where are you doing your mastermind? Is that online or is it going to be at a venue? Is it exclusive retreat? So is that coming out of the fee or do they have to pay over and above that? Okay, so all of those things are going to be important to I now before you do the actual group. But just imagine that, you know, let's say that it was 50,000 pounds and let's say I just did that twice a year. So 100,000 pounds. Who would like to have 100,000 pounds a year for working 72 hours? Anybody? 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 Just me. <laughs> Is it common to pay for guest speakers? That depends. Sometimes guest speakers will come and do it for free. Uh, but it depends, really. I think if you want quality people, then probably you're going to pay. Uh, it just depends for what purpose. So groups can meet virtually or they can meet in person. And of course, that's also going to have an impact uh, logistically. How much is going to cost? Uh, if you meet in person, you pay for the venue. There's coffees, teas. What time of the day are you doing it? So is there lunch included or is it in the evening? Do you have dinner time and so forth? So masterminds can also be very personal and keep the number of participants small. Yeah, I think if you, you know, if you get more than 10 people, then actually it can become a little bit unwieldy and also depends on the structure that you're going to follow. So probably eight to 10 people is a, is a good one. But, you know, there are groups that might have 20, 30 people, and then they just have some facilitators with some breakout rooms. Consider how and if you record the meetings. Remember privacy and confidentiality. So, example, one of the masterminds I was in uh, specifically for uh, a group of business owners, 
And, you know, some of the things that were discussed actually would be highly confidential. And so those sessions couldn't be recorded. Let's say it was Coke, the, the CEO of Coke, and he was talking about their formula for Coke. Well, probably you wouldn't want to have, well, he wouldn't want to have that recorded and put all over social media so everybody knows how to make their own Coke. So who's your ideal participant? Have the members that actually can collaborate with each other and not compete. So if you've got people that are going to compete in the group, then they may not be putting in their best to help the other person because, of course, they see it as competition. You see, this really has got to be about collaboration. Consider your desired outcome and your purpose for your group. Okay, so for what purpose are you doing your mastermind? What is the actual outcome? Is it a mastermind to help businesses grow? Is it a specific mastermind within a specific niche in business? Is it just for financial advisors, as an example? Okay, so what is the, what's the outcome? So here's an example. In fact, I'm going to give you two different examples of uh, doing a mastermind. So this first one is, let's say it's three hours, but there's only going to be two people in the hot seat. Okay, so you welcome everybody. There's a quick check-in. That's about two minutes. Maybe a grounding exercise. So this might be just an, uh, an example where everybody just close their eyes and get in touch with the breath. And maybe you do just like a quick little five-minute mindfulness exercise just to ground everybody and uh, you know, get, leave the world outside. Report on member wins. So each person just gets a quick opportunity. What's happened to them that's been uh, really good over the last week or month or whatever since the last meeting. And of course, that's very similar to when we start group, when we start our one-to-one -one coaching and we're saying, what would you like to celebrate about yourself? So asking about the wins gets everybody G'd up and, and really excited, right? Then you've got your hot seat. So the hot seat is the person that's presenting the problem. In this particular case, we're only going to have two people in this format, and it takes maybe 45 minutes to do it this way. So the member describes the objective and what kind of support they want, and also the consequences for not achieving, as well as the payoffs for the achievement of the goal. So that takes them about three minutes. So they say, hey, my name is Wayne. This is my business. This is the problem that I need to solve. Three minutes. Then the group clarifies their understanding of the outcome. Okay, so everybody in the group, they get to ask me questions five to seven minutes so that they can clearly understand what's the outcome that I want to achieve. Now, one, they get to understand it, but two, actually by asking good, powerful questions, I get to understand it better. And a well-defined problem is already half solved. So this is where your facilitator comes in really handy as well. So when you facilitate, you also want to make sure you ask powerful questions to help that clarification. Then you brainstorm. So the group brainstorms the outcome for that hot seat member. Now, remember, when we did brainstorming in PRAC, we said all ideas are validated. Okay, None are dismissed. None are minimized. Everybody's idea is worthwhile to write down. Because if we're going to minimize or we're going to invalidate somebody's uh, suggestion or something that they've brainstormed, then they might feel, oh, well, it doesn't help. I say anything because you guys always sh shoot me down, right? So everybody's idea gets written down. And that's going to take probably about 20 minutes. Then you can action plan. So the group works out for the hot seat member uh, to turn ideas into a workable plan of action. And also the, the commitments for support and they plan. So the secretary is going to write all of that down, right? They're going to write down the timeline. When is this hot seat member? When are they going to do? What are they going to do? How are they going to measure the outcome? And then the hot seat member thanks the group and confirms the action plan. So guys, thank you very much for helping me with this. This is what I'm going to do. I think that's the best route forward. And this is what I'm going to do. And I'll report back to you at the next meeting. Or, of course, if there was this closed Facebook group, which they had access to. Then there's a value wrap. So everybody says what they learned and took away from the hot seat process, 
So this isn't about the hot seat member anymore. It's just about what they learned from that brainstorming because there might be things that they can implement in their own lives and their own businesses. Okay, how can they apply that learning? So it's a very meta, a meta way of learning. They're evaluating what they've learned and how they're going to implement that. Then you might have a five to 10 minute break. Then round two. So the next member hops in the hot seat and you go through that process again. Then again, there could be a five minute break or you might just ask request for support. So who needs any support in the next week, month before you meet again? Open sharing. So who's taken away what? Is there anything else that anybody would like to bring to the table? Any changes in laws or during this particular time, maybe how can they claim additional tax rebates, whatever it might be, right? Anything that, that they think the other members might find useful. And then you wrap it up. So in this case, only two people got to sit in the hot seat. Now we can do it another way. And this thing just happens foster. And again, we have this welcome with grounding exercise, get everybody to give their win. And in this case, the hot seat member only gets 15 minutes. Now, don't think because they only get 15 minutes that suddenly, you know, maybe they don't get as much from the actual uh, mastermind, right? A mastermind doesn't have to be 45 minutes. They literally can be, they can even be as little as 10 minutes you know, for, for the person in the hot seat. It's just about being focused and the amount of people that you've got in the group as well. So again, member describes the objective, but now they've only got a minute rather than three minutes. So it's about being clear and succinct. So you don't come as, let's say I'm coming with my problem this week, and then I go sit there and you say, okay, Wayne, what's your problem? And go, mm, uh, maybe, mm, yeah, I don't know, game over. Okay, remember we said those four keys. People have got to have a commitment. They've got to be prepared when they come to the mastermind. Again, the group clarifies the understanding, takes five minutes. You brainstorm, and that's going to take another five minutes. Action planning, which is going to take another five minutes. The hot seat member thanks the group, confirms the action plan, which can take a minute. And then again, you've got a break for five minutes. Round two, break for five minutes, and then you just carry, you, you loop the same process. Now that might be five or six people, depends whether you take those five minute breaks in between as well. Uh, you might only do a five minute break after every three or four members. But probably your entire uh, process, like I said, it really shouldn't be more than three hours, you know, and you need to have time to, to give people that time to break and also do some networking. Okay, and then again, similar request for support, open sharing, and wrapping it up. Does that make sense? Who's got questions about the mastermind? Mastermind is not group coaching. In your group coaching, you, the facilitator, from the point of view, is you going to be asking most of the questions. In right. your mastermind, it's about the group coming up with ideas specifically for that, that one particular member. Like I said, if I use the example of different business owners, maybe I've got a, an accountant, uh, a lawyer, and you know the other business person that's there is a financial advisor, and the person who sits in the hot seat is a, a car dealership. And the car dealership says, you know what, guys, we're going through this coronavirus. And I tell you what, I, I just don't know how to be, to be sending out any more cars because uh, Ford have said, if I don't shift a thousand cars this month, I'm going to lose my Ford dealership. You know, what can I do to create awareness? And the financial advisor says, hmm, let me understand. So you need to, uh, by the way, what are the... What are the implications if you did leasing finance rather than HP purchase, right? Or, and so they come up with these different ideas and they brainstorm and the person walks away and says, yes, that's what I'm going to go and do. Does that make sense to you, Bob? Yeah, that does. That's clear. Thank you. Yeah. Good.
if we move on so again on page 17 and 18 we've got some questions there for you that can help you to become clearer on your mastermind if you do do it if it's right for you the types of people you want to work with etc okay any other questions before we do online courses we started yesterday by saying create your content create your intellectual property by essentially using the framework of creating a course now the beauty of that course is i can take elements again if i use the nlp training as the example the complete nlp training is the course i can take just building rapport and i can create a workshop around that okay so i've taken an element of my course of my intellectual property to create a workshop right to, to chunk it down and the idea of that workshop might have been just to create awareness or it could have been you know with some free offers like i'm doing a free introduction to nlp training a one-day training workshop and it just gives them a little bit of information so that i and that can be free so that i can upsell the entire course so that would be an example of taking my content chunking it down and doing a workshop but now I can also take that course and I can deliver it as an online course. So what do I do? I can record my existing live training or I can very much like we're doing here where I'm doing a screenshot for you. I can literally talk and I've got my, my snowball microphone here and I can literally talk and record the screen whilst I'm busy speaking over the and, and and going through the slides and so a lot of the online courses that you've that you've done with me you'll see are actually you know uh, the screen that's being recorded and then i give you information okay so again why might i do the online courses okay well if you think the e-learning industry revenue exceeds 250 billion dollars a year and they reckon that by 2025, it's about 325 billion. So what does that equal? Well, that equals huge opportunity, doesn't it? I mean, there's a lot of people that would like to learn, but they just, you know, they might not be able to make it to the live trainings or they might not be able to afford the live trainings. So there's a person by the name of Joseph Michael Nicoletti. And he was just a curious novice, right? He was looking at writing his novel on Shrivna. So Shrivna is a, is a software online package to help write uh, books. And he, as he was going through this process, learning, etc., he thought, hey, you know what? There must be other people that also want to learn how to write their books and, and learn how to use Shrivna. And so now he makes about twenty dollars to $30,000 a month just helping other people write their novels with Shrivna. So there's an example of taking a, an existing problem, other people that might be in the same boat, really identifying your niche and creating something that's going to help them get to a solution. So what type of courses can we do? They might be text only, they could be video, they could be audio, it could be a Zoom cord, it could be a recording of the live course. If you think universities and colleges and even some schools are using online tools now. In fact, Brooke, my youngest, while she's at home uh, during this time, she's getting a lot of her homework uh, through Google, uh, uh, is it Google, Google Classroom, I think they're using. Uh, and she's doing all her learnings that way, right? So ask yourself, do you build or make something that others want to learn from? Now, if we, th this is more big picture. This, so this says that really anybody can create an online course. So I don't want this to be just about coaching because the, all these things that we're talking about are true for all businesses, okay? Or certainly for most businesses. And, you know, I might create a course just for teaching business people how to, create and utilize Excel, right? Or maybe there's new secretaries. My daughter, oldest daughter, she wants to go to college now. She wants to become a, a personal trainer and that. Maybe she needs to learn how to use Excel. 
And so she can go do an online course just about that. Okay, so we just want to find the niche, find the client. So what I thought I'd do is I'm just going to show you a little bit of a walkthrough. Here is a course. These courses are currently on Teachable. Okay, Teachable is just another platform. So this particular platform, I've got more control over. I can create the, the page as I want it to be. And I can control the fees, right? So these courses, I'm all selling at $97. Uh, but this particular one is actually just about Zoom. Okay, so... Uh, I'm considering offering this course. It's a, a video course on how to set up Zoom and how to utilize Zoom. Okay. Now, I haven't decided if I'm really going to offer it. I think I'm just going to do it for like $9. But I don't know whether it might be useful for people or not. So I'm in two minds at the moment. But essentially, what I do is I've created. So this is what my, my uh, page would look like, where it would be sold. Okay, slightly bigger. You should be able to see yeah, I'm hovering over trainers training. Can you see that? So this is what my homepage might look like, right? With all the individual courses. But you can see the Zoom course is not there at the moment. Okay, so what I would do is I go into my setup. Now I've already within the curriculum over here, I've already uploaded a number of different videos. And just as it loads. So these are all dif different videos in this particular course. So there's only two sections, but there's 30 something videos, right? And I can go and say, okay, well, how much do I want to charge for this course? So this particular course, I'm only going to charge $9 for if I decide to go ahead and actually do it. I also can say, okay, well, what are the pages that are involved in this course? Well, I need to have a sales page and my sales page would look something like this. If somebody clicks on the actual specific course, they can see it. There's an introduction video for them. Ask them to enroll. There's an example of the course curriculum. So they see all of the, you know, all of the stuff that's actually involved in the course. So this is just the trainer's training. A little bit of information about me and how much the course actually is. Right? So that's what I would do within my setup of my sales page. So how would I do that? I click on there and I can simply go and edit. So all of those things are editable. So if I want to change the picture in the top here, I can say, okay, I can replace the image and I can put in another image or I can add some text. I can add some text just underneath. So in this case, I say become a Zoom powerhouse. But if you notice here, if, uh, Zoom for webinars, if I go and change it and say Zoom for the web, okay? So that's how simple it is to actually change what's going to be said on the sales page. Okay, so I'm just going to leave that Zoom for webinars, right? I can go and add in some video. So there is a video here I've got to upload as a sales video. I can add extra buttons. So the buttons are simply, in this case, I can go and say what color I want my button. What do I want to say on the button? So rather than saying enroll now, I say take course or how's it or whatever I want to put in there. Uh, my course curriculum. So my potential student sees what are they going to, to be getting during that. Uh, I like to put an image just so that they know who you are with a little bit of description. You can go put in your pricing. Now, it actually auto fills that in for you because you already said on the previous page how much you're going to charge for the course. And then essentially, like I said, your whole system, your whole, uh, all your courses that you've got on your website live there. Now, it's really simple to go and do. Uh, like I said, you simply go, you just follow the instructions. They've actually got lots of videos to help you. So you upload your videos. You can, if I go look at another course, give you another example, actually. Um, let's say the, the trainer's training.
So for the trainer's training, that's what my sales video would be, my course curriculum, again, any other information, photos I want to upload, how much they're going to charge, etc. But if I want to change the curriculum, go, okay, so here are the videos that actually I've added into the individual modules. So that's module one, that's module two. Now, if I wanted to go add another lecture, all I do is add lecture. There it is. And now I can go and edit that lecture and I can say either I'm going to drag a video if I want to add a, a video file or I want to add some text into that. Hello world. Uh, hello world. World. Can I spell today? Uh, and maybe I want to call this uh, the best lecture okay so i go back and suddenly there the best lecture exists yeah with whatever content i've put onto it but maybe you know what i want to change this i don't want it to be there i actually want it to go be right at the top so i can just drag it across now it's still in draft so it doesn't actually exist in my course until i go take it out of draft but you know what? I don't really want to have this within it because it doesn't, it's not part of the course. It shouldn't be there. So it's very easy for me just to go and delete it. Okay. And so I can make up each of my lectures. So this, I can't remember. I think this one's got about 50 videos. And if I want to add another section, I can go do another section as well, which you just can't see at the moment. But it's behind my picture there. Like I said, different pages, my thank you page, etc. I can see my students who's enrolled in the course. I can see how much money I've made through the course, etc. So the beauty with the online courses is that for those clients who can't afford to come to the live training or maybe uh, they, they can't get to the live training because it's a different country or that, they can go ahead and do the online courses. And it's also passive income. You know, the, the beauty of being able to make money while you sleep is, uh, is, is the holy grail, I think, right? So I'm not going to go spend too much time on the online courses just to show you that there's some really easy ways to do it, depending on what platforms you use and why you want to use it. So there's a time and a place. Uh, you know, it serves different marketplaces, but I... Definitely, for me personally, I'm heading much more down this route. And why that's also applicable is the next section is actually all about membership sites. And uh, I can't do a membership site through something like Udemy, but I can certainly use Teachable to, uh, to do a, a membership site as well. Right. Actually, Sandra, sorry, you asked me, what do I use to do my recordings? So I use a, either my Canon ATD uh, DLSR camera. Or otherwise, I've actually got a big conferencing uh, video recorder as well. It kind of just depends what I need to record. The DLSR will only record up to 30 minutes. So I'll do it for shorter videos. If I'm doing screen recording, then, well, that's just recording what's on my actual screen. And I use a software package called CyberLink. In fact, if you've done the how to create online courses, online course that I've got, I do a walkthrough on that and actually show you some of the different things that I use uh, and also how to do some of the editing, etc. Okay, on one of your new courses, you have a fancy background. Does Teachable have that? So what I would use for that is for backgrounds, I actually just use green screen. And in your record, in your uh, editing software, you just change the green screen into another, uh, another type of backdrop. In fact, you can even do that in Zoom here as well. So I can go and change my background and it looks like I'm in outer space. Okay, so green screen is actually pretty simple to do. Okay. Uh, do they have specific sizes? Yes, it just depends on what your actual question is, what they have with specific sizes. But just so we don't spend too much time on that and actually uh, go ahead and move on, please feel free to, you know, to uh, ask me a question at the end. If, once we've gone through the membership sites and the webinars, if anybody wants to then ask any questions, yeah, let's go through that then. Okay. 
So again, there's some questions there for you on page 19 to 23 that can help you to define. Actually, you'll see it's very much the same questions as when you looked at your online course, but now we'll just be looking at doing it through, uh, sorry, your, your live trainings, but how you can do them for online, but then also you've got to decide on your platforms. Like I said, I created a course on how to create online courses, which is on that Teachable site, uh, which many of you actually already have. And uh, that, that goes through a lot of these things. So let's talk about membership sites. If you need some extra income, or again, your calendar is filled with one-to-one -one clients, or even your group coaching clients, right? Or if you want to leverage your time, you know, you want to help more people, more knowledge. Remember that if we trade time for money, we can always only hit a ceiling because there's only so many hours within the day. But with the membership site, essentially, like when we're selling our online courses, the membership site is essentially that. But what we're doing is we're bundling things. Okay? We're giving more things within bundles and they pay a monthly membership to do that. Okay, and this there can be many ways in how we do that. So recurring revenue, of course, is going to be huge. Uh, you can foster connections at a lower price point. So rather than me selling every one of my courses at $97 uh, per course, I might say, you know, it's a monthly membership for $20 and you have access to all of the courses as long as you pay the monthly membership. Now, some people might go and they might do all of the courses within one month and they only pay $20. Good for them, right? Uh, other people might be taking their time. What you find is often people start memberships and they very rarely cancel them. So I'll give you a suggestion. Go look at your bank account and see how many direct debits you've got on your bank account, which either you totally forgot you had or it's things that you never get involved with, subscriptions you never follow up with. Uh, a gym membership is a prime example of that. People pay for a gym membership and very often hardly ever go to it. Okay, but now you want to offer good quality content that's going to keep your clients coming back. But if they do start the membership, provide you offer that quality content, you know, they will uh, very regularly stay for much longer. Again, it's potential upsells with future offers or exclusive deals. Increase sustainable revenue stream. Imagine if you knew that you've got 100 subscribers on your membership site and you're charging them $27 each per month. You know that before you get out of bed on the first of the month, you've already made $2,700. So you create it once and you use it multiple times. I've said this so many times. Do something once and get multiple bang for your buck. In fact, I was coaching somebody this morning. I guess I was coaching somebody this morning who said, well, create a video once and I can take that same video. I can put it on YouTube. I can put it on Instagram. I can put it on LinkedIn. I can put it on Facebook. I can use the link to go to my website. I can use it to create a membership site. I use the video or whatever that might be for whatever purpose I'm doing it to get them to sign up to my email list. Doing something once and getting multiple bang for your buck is a very smart way of working, right? So consider all of the content that maybe you've created before. I think one of the big mistakes people make is they first write it and then they try to find a place for it. So really, actually, the best time to think about repurposing your content is actually when you plan it. So plan, how are you going to use whatever it is that you're busy creating? Okay, so if you like most coaches, you know, maybe you probably spend way too much time actually trying to be everywhere, please everybody, trying to do everything. So how much time do you actually spend on creating content every month? And probably a lot of coaches don't spend much time or they spend a tremendous amount of time but it doesn't actually make them any money. And maybe you do a handout or a checklist or a blog article or whatever. The idea is you want to repurpose that content. Create it once, use it multiple times. Okay? Just ask yourself, how are you going to do it? How are you going to reuse it before you actually create it? And there's a difference between regurgitating it and repurposing it. 
So you're creating essentially a library of your content. So create repetitious content types, whether that's a series of books or a series of worksheets or monthly workshops or a series of emails. So something that's on repetition, something that new people can use, new people that maybe you've got a particular coaching program and everybody that comes into your program has got to go through this particular process. So one of the things I'm looking at implementing now is when I take on one-to-one -one clients, uh, they've got to come for at least a three-month coaching program. But part of that program is that they do the NLP training. In doing that, and so there's a reason for that, right? They come and do the NLP training so we can get rid of a lot of the blocks and, and actually start getting a lot of the knowledge that makes the coaching easier afterwards. Whilst I've got to deliver that NLP training live, and that's taking up some of my time, just replace that with whatever online content or worksheets or whatever else you might have that any of your clients will typically have to go through. They get people into the habit of buying from you as well. So if I have my clients on my membership site, and they consistently just paying, just remember, it's just a little yes, yeah? yes, 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 every month, just that little commitment, it's $20, whatever it is, so that when you then go and make some of your larger offers, provided you've kept them happy, you've delivered good quality content, then they're much more likely to buy your larger, more expensive product. Now, I say create this library of your content, and then you make it available through your membership site. Use content to create course materials. So make more content available as they progress. So I can take, let's say I didn't have a course. Yeah, we, we didn't have a live training yet. But you've got lots of different workshops that you might be able to deliver. You might think, okay, all of these workshops, how do I put them together to create one course? So let's say I didn't have an NLP training, but I had a workshop on anchoring on parts integration on submodalities etc and then put them all together to create the nlp training essentially that's how the nlp training was created in the first place right so put your course content put it together to create content and you know get them to progress and membership sites also like you to experience reoccurring income like i said waking up every month and having that income before you actually started working for the new month takes a lot of pressure off. And if you don't have that pressure of having to chase the next paycheck or chase the next client, well, then you also don't come across as, as needy to get that next client. And so when you have that, that first phone call with a potential client and uh, you know, you, you're not trying to sell them, you're just having a conversation and you come more from a place of power, more from a place of authority. And I don't mean power over the other person. I mean power from the point of view is you're not needy. Because when you become needy, you actually start pushing people away as well. Okay, so make a list of your content. What forms have you got? What checklists have you got? What instructions, workshops, social media posts? You know, do you have your things on your page, on your groups, groups that you run, uh, maybe groups that you are in? So you can look at how you can repurpose content as well. Like I said, model, don't copy. You can look at past emails to subscribers. As you know, on my website, I've got the seven keys to achievable outcome. Well, that's just a mini email series over seven weeks that actually is part of the NLP training. And they're just little snippets. You might have done certain blog posts. Most of you know I'm busy writing a coaching book, but I'm not actually sitting down just writing the book. I'm writing all my posts and ebooks, etc., and then I bring it all together and I will publish it in a book. You might have done videos. Think of the videos that you've done or what you can do and how you can repurpose those into a course. Audio files, recorded webinars, live trainings, online courses, etc. Okay? Even your retreats, if you can, if you recorded them, if you're allowed to record them. Remember, just like your masterminds, maybe there's some things you can record and some things you don't want to record. 
break your content down into chunks. Make them part of your membership uh, site. Uh, make them part of a course, as we said before. You can market them as a complete course, or you can market them as individual courses, like the practitioner or the master practitioner, so you have an upsell. You can write a book from your content. We mentioned that. One way, or one way that you can repurpose your content, I don't know if you've ever heard of PLRs, so private label rights. Private label, so there'll be a content creator. And you get different memberships or different rights within private label as well. One that you can simply put your name on and you say you created it. Or you can get private label rights where you can say you created it, you can change it, and you can sell it as a course or, or whatever, right? There's different ways of doing private label rights. There's actually websites with private label rights or PLR websites. Be sure to know that, that most PLRs are rubbish. Okay, if you buy a PLR, most of it is crap. It can help to save time, but like I said, most of them are rubbish. So you've got to be wary of where you get your, P, your PLRs from. Now, why is it of benefit if you use your content? Well, if you are giving your content to be used as a PLR, essentially, it's almost like going joint venture partner with people. You are making your content available for other people to sell and to reuse in their own way, but you sell it at a much reduced price. So example, instead of selling my trainer's training for $97 as the course, because uh, I'm selling it, I might sell it as a PLR through these joint venture partners and the people can actually go and claim that they created it. So I remove all of my coaching with NLP branding and maybe I sell it for only $10. But there's 100,000 people that actually want to buy that course content so that they can go and change it and do whatever they want to do with it. So if I've got 100,000 people that want to buy it at $10 each, well, <laughs> then it's probably worthwhile doing it, right? Of course, remember that if you're selling it like that through joint venture partners, that they might want to take 30, 40, 50%, depending on what your agreement is. You could also just take your coaching things and again, remove the branding and have other people use it for private use. So during PRAC, for some of you, you might already have it, some not. I said that uh, I've got a suite of things like a, an Excel form as an example for using as an invoice, right? Or your letterhead or a coaching agreement or whatever. So I've got a number of different forms and all you've got to do is double click on it and it will tell you in yellow, uh, just like it says here by number three, you've got the yellow. It says, we'll actually tell you double click here and add your email address. Double click here and add your logo, whatever it might be. So I remove my branding from it and I can sell it so that other coaches can use it. So they pay me a small fee. I created it once. They all pay me a small fee and they'll be able to reuse it. Now for you, I just created it and I give it to you for free and I say, go and use it. The only difference is you get it for free, whereas I could sell it to other people. Does that make sense? You can also add your content as bonuses for members only content. Right? So again, on your membership site or as a live course. So I give a lot of my online courses as bonuses for people who come and do practitioner. So if you come and do PRAC, you get the mindfulness training as a free bonus, right? Or the goal setting course as a free bonus. So your client, your potential client feels that they're getting a lot of value. Uh, Adlin, what's the, uh, what's the incentive for people to pay you instead of copying? I'm not quite sure what you mean because to get your content, they've got to pay you in the first place. So that's how they're getting it. And then they're going to have to change it or edit it in some way. For some PLRs, they don't have any option to copy uh, or sorry, to change anything. They've got to use it just as they use it. Okay, so I hope that answers your question. Again, page 24 to 26, some information on the membership site. So one of the things that I can do using Teachable as the example 
uh, you'll remember we saw that there's all the, the different uh, online courses available. I can actually create a membership site. So I create a specific uh, membership page and I select all of those courses that are going to be available in the membership. What's the monthly reoccurring revenue? So what do they have to pay every month? And provided they pay, they still have access. Do they get all of the content at once? Is it drip fed? So they only get one new course every month. I can do that with the courses that I already have. Or I can do things like this. So let's say we're busy doing a workshop. I can record the workshop and I can go and add the workshop to the membership site, right? So for, for let's say it was specifically a gear at coaches and I can add to the coach, to the membership site additional ways and how you can increase your profits and your visibility. So there's many different things that you can uh, actually add to your membership site. But think of it simply as an extension of your online courses. But it's not only your online courses. It's lots of different content that you can add on there. If I was having a membership site for coaches, then I might do, let's say I had some clients that were okay with me recording our coaching sessions, then I might record those coaching sessions and I can add those coaching sessions to the membership site because it's helping the members actually become better coaches by hearing how do we deal with certain types of clients. Yebo, yeah, any questions about membership sites? So let's talk about webinars then. Whilst I said, you know, we'll talk about seven different ways. There's actually so many different ways how you can increase your visibility and profits, right? Webinars is just another way of doing that. If you want another stream of income, then automated webinars may be a good way of doing that. I don't know if you've ever been on automated webinars. Uh, maybe you, you are on Facebook and they said, hey, download this free ebook. And then they say to you, oh, by the way, there's going to be a webinar in the next half an hour or whatever. And it's going to be specific content that you were interested in. And you pop in your details and you go log on. And the webinar is playing. But actually, that webinar was actually recorded. And it could have been years ago. It's just the same webinar that plays over and over. And people just log in. And so that's an automated webinar. And it can consist consistently deliver you income. The point with the webinar is that you're creating awareness for something that you're going to sell later in the webinar. Okay. So you do all the work up front and then you can reap the rewards for years to come. Again, depending on the type of webinar that you're doing. So the beauty is you can set it up and you can pretty much forget about it. Just like this little guy who's been forgotten about yeah, in, in his cell in prison. Eh? So it just serves as a sales tool. So you can create your webinar, you can drive traffic to a webinar registration page, you have your registrants choose the day or the time that they want to view, and then you direct your attendees to your paid product at the end of the webinar. So that's pretty much a very big picture four-step process, right? You've created the webinar, you drive traffic, so that would be the example of you're on Facebook and you say, yes, I'm really interested in this, you fill in your details, you pick what day, what time. And then you're going to get an email to remind you when the webinar comes up. You click on it, you view the webinar, and at the end of the webinar, there's a product that's being sold. But because that's happening on autopilot, you did it once, and you know, it just keeps on making you money afterwards over and over. So the first thing to do is to plan the purpose of your webinar okay, before you actually choose the topic. So what do you want the webinar to sell or what do you want it to promote? Yeah, do you want it to, to sell you or promote you some, uh, some weight loss coaching clients? What's the purpose? Okay. It might be one-to-one -one or group coaching packages. It might be a course. So I might have a webinar specifically to, for people that are interested in coaching, right? Or interested in becoming coaches. And so they watch this webinar where I talk about life coaching industry, how much money you can make, how rewarding it is, and all the good stuff about life coaching. And then at the end, I say, by the way, we have a life coaching course that's available. Okay, so that would be the idea there. 
You can promote workshops or other personalized services, right? Group coaching, whatever it might be. You can have a bundle of products that you're selling. In fact, you might have seen webinars before where at the end of they go and they, uh, certainly if you've seen any of the click funnel webinars, you know, they'll say, oh, you're going to get this product and this product and this product. This product was a thousand that, that thousand, that thousand, this product, this product. And then they say, what if all this did was only saved you a little bit of time? What if all this did was make you a little bit of extra money? What if, but now we're also going to give you that and that and that. So just to recap, you're getting this, 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 and this, plus this, 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 and this, and this. And we would never charge you all of that. We're only going to charge you this. Okay. And so they're selling the product. Okay. So they bundled a number of things together. So the webinar really tells the story or demonstrates the problem. And then your paid offer at the end presupposes the solution. Okay? So there's a presupposition here that what you're going to offer at the end is going to help overcome whatever you presented during the webinar. Next brainstorm, the ideas for the webinar itself, meaning what relates to the paid offer. Okay. So if you want to sell weight loss coaching, then your webinar should probably be about weight loss. If I want to sell weight loss group coaching packages at the end, it doesn't help my webinar is talking about snakes. So map out your webinar content. What are you going to do during the webinar? Map out your pre and post webinar email series. So your pre webinar is just that little reminders of when is the webinar, what time is it? What's going to be discussed? Maybe what bonuses, etc. And the post webinar is after the webinar has actually happened. And that will include a number of things. It could be a funnel where maybe you had uh, clients that dropped out. They didn't watch the entire webinar. So you might send them a recording. Hey, sorry, you had to leave. He has a recording of the webinar. Or you have people that have gone through the entire webinar and they bought your product at the end. So you've got follow up from there. It says, thank you for buying the product. And by the way, because we so much like to serve, he has an undisclosed bonus you're going to receive as well. Or maybe you have somebody that watched to the end and they didn't buy anything. And thank you for watching. Now we know that sometimes, you know, people aren't ready to buy uh, straight away. Now, just to be clear that there's a specific timer where you get this bonus. But if you, you know, if you still need a little bit more convincing, uh, let's add you an extra bonus, right? Or just to remind you that time is running out or whatever your post webinar email series might be. Then you deliver your webinar and make sure to record it, of course, because that's what you're going to use as the automated webinar. Okay, you want to convince them to take action. So offer them a special fast action bonus. If you buy this product today, you're going to get 97% off. Okay. You can offer them discounted for a limited time. You can only do this within the next 60 minutes. You can offer payment plans. You can do countdown timers you know, to portray urgency. Uh, urgency is a great way to, for the people that have FOMO, fear of missing out. Uh, although I don't really like using the urgency, especially not if you use the urgency and then later you make it available anyway. Well, because then you actually lied. Okay. So be sure just to use it in the right way. And on page 27 to 30 is some exercises in regards to setting up your webinar and to be able to help you. Now, there's lots of different webinar platforms that you can actually use. I rate Zoom. I love Zoom. Uh, I think this is definitely going to be something that I'll be using pretty much exclusively in the future. So you want to be sure are you going to use webinars? How are you going to use them? For what purpose? And what's going to be your return on investment? Because, you know, otherwise it's just not worth it. So I always say don't be penny wise and pound foolish. Spend money where it's necessary to spend the money. But make sure that you then actually get a return on investment. Okay. Of course, you can do retreats. So retreat would be example, I said earlier, I might do the practitioner and the master practitioner in Bali for three weeks. And that would be an example of doing as a retreat. You can do coaching retreats. 
You can do yoga retreats. You can do retreats for all sorts of things. Your, your mastermind can be a retreat. I don't know if you've seen these on Facebook where you get a 10-day challenge or a five-day challenge. In fact, two weeks ago, I think it was, I did a five-day challenge to read a book per day. Uh, you can certainly monetize podcasts. Another way of doing podcasts is really just about creating awareness and then driving traffic to other products that you might have. Like I said, there's, there's a number of different ways in, in how you can actually grow your audience and become more profitable. Okay, guys, so thank you so much for your time. Uh, has anybody got any questions that you know, I can answer for you now?